Institutional ethnography is a method developed by Dorothy Smith, and we will talk about it today, and I won't be able to really introduce it in much details, because I only <laughs> have very, very few minutes, so I'm going to allow you to have a look at the book while I'm speaking, if you wanted to transmit it between you. So, um, <coughs> uh, institutional ethnography uh, is best explained by an old uh, feminist story of a woman who's uh, walking along the river and when she comes around the bridge she sees uh, a woman that falls from the bridge into the water. So she jumps immediately into the water and saves <coughs> her out and while she's trying to get dry on the river bank she sees another woman uh, falling off the bridge into the water and so she jumps immediately after her to save uh, the second one as well and she's uh, uh, up there on the river bank trying to get to where she was uh, going to uh, arrive but she, uh, she sees another woman now she gets hesitant should she um, should she jumps into the river and saves her too or perhaps she says to herself I should climb up the bridge and see who is throwing these women off the bridge into the water. So that is basically the idea of the institutional, institutional part in the institutional ethnography. That is, we are interested here, Dorothy Smith called her method a sociology for people because she was interested not just in connecting to people's standpoint and to people's experiences, but to the processes and procedures in the institutional context that shape these uh, experiences and permeates into daily lives, decision making, what uh, preferences and whatever is experienced as rational for us. So after I said to you something about the institutional part of institutional ethnography, let me explain why it's called ethnography because we are not doing anything to do with participant observations. It's not based about going and living with uh, people or just being with other people and immersing into the cultural daily uh, practices, but uh, it, is, um, sh it shares with ethnographers the assumption that as researchers we don't really know what is it that we want to ask about the field? We want to learn what are the relevant questions. We want to be very inductive, that is we want to um, understand how people understand their routines <coughs> and then begin ask, learn from them what to ask, what the puzzles are and try and answer these puzzles through looking at these institutional spaces which they encounter in their daily lives. So um, this is the principle and as you can see the emphasis is on ruling relations. The ruling relations. Dorothy Smith is a Canadian sociologist and there's no surprise that we began introducing her method through a feminist activist story. That is because she's a feminist. She, since 1984, she's writing about uh, studies and ex sorry, doing research with women and about women's standpoint. She's also a Marxist. She's also a ethno an ethnomethodologist. And in institutional et ethnography, she brings together all these three uh, important influences on her work. So um, what I did is try to apply her methods in the area of privatized services to understand the institutional context in which occupational, uh, em sorry, employment arrangements are designed. You will have to bear with my English today, I'm very sorry about that, but I can't do a lot now. <laughs> uh, so what is ruling relations? What does she refer to when she says to us that we, we need to understand the ruling relations? Of course we understand that it's about power, power, the power of subjugating, the power of subordination. So the question is who subordinates who? So in her in Dorothy Smith's view, what we have is people 
uh, living and working in uh, social spaces, but not uh, really uh, or not always understand exactly uh, what are the processes that shape these spaces. And so they also <coughs> not necessarily are aware, and this is, a, I'm sure, a, a, a point that we will have a debate about uh, very soon after I'll finish speaking, uh, they're not always aware of how their choices, their preferences are shaped by forms of knowledge and processes uh, and interests that originate elsewhere, originate not in people's routine, not in people's households, but in the social structures that we are part of. And uh, this is how Dorothy Smith sees the ruling relations. So you see that here's a, a woman, and the question is, what sits on her shoulders? Right? Her shoulders carry huge, very heavy uh, social operations, uh, actually aspects of uh, the institutional context within, this, uh, within which the woman operates. So in Dorothy Smith's work, this woman sends her child to school. Okay? So she is just uh, preparing uh, the sandwiches for the child to have at school. But how is this action of preparing a sandwich for a daughter to go to school, how is this is institutionally shaped, right? So in order to understand that, we want to listen to the woman and hear about the sandwich that she prepares in the morning. But that in itself is just the starting point. So the woman's standpoint about the sandwich is a is a starting point for the study. Now we want to understand the conditions or the procedures or the uh, mm, processes that shape the decision making, making that is related to the sandwich. For example, what? The question of what should we put in that sandwich, right? Because perhaps 20 years ago we could put in that sandwich some chocolate spread. I don't know how it was here in this country, but today this is unheard of, right? Because who is the mother who would dare put this chocolate spread in her daughter's uh, sandwich? Because now what we have to do put there in the sandwich? Vegetables, right? <laughs> and we have to emphasize the fresh fruit. So this, this idea of how ideas about mothering, so standards of um, standards of mothering and teaching are coming into the daily routine, the daily decision making, the daily understanding of what is rational at a certain point. But that in itself is not enough. What we want to know is that the mother, perhaps she's a single mother, she belongs to a category and the category has a spe specific way within a professional discourse. But the professional discourse doesn't exist in itself. It exists and um, corresponds with political and bureaucratic ways of organizing education. And all this is part of an even heavier structure, heavier institutional force, and that's the state. But we don't want to forget the important issue of class, which also fits in because uh, the work organization of mothering and teaching is not going to be similar in any specific class position. There are going to be differences. Of course, we could go into ex um, illustrating various studies that have shown that. But the, it is important that all these structures are um, are shaping, are feeding in, cultivate specific daily routines. That if we would only look at the routines, we would be able to generalize about women's experiences, but not so much about the political context that shapes these uh, experiences. So for Dorothy Smith, it is important that what we do in our work is create the linkage find the linkage, map the linkage, she uses a, a lot the issue of mapping, find the way to link between what is everyday experience and what really are practices that are coming from uh, extra local um, levels 
of ruling and governing. So that would be, this creating the linkage would be the first principle of uh, institutional ethnography. And so uh, we want to know what are the kind of questions we can ask when we, um, sorry, what are kind of questions that we want to raise when we're doing institutional ethnography. This would be how questions rather than why questions. So we're not into uh, explaining or creating or presenting some <coughs> causal arguments, but rather understand procedures, understand what is it exactly that a woman would encounter when she enters the institutional space around her. And what type of evidence can we achieve while using institutional ethnography? This would be primarily the effects of social policy. So you see the strong linkage between what happens to us in the daily life and the level of social policy. What are the effects of the social policy? And not only that, but also the political orientation of those involved in shaping the policy and materializing or fulfilling the policy, like the bureaucrats uh, that uh, the woman actually would meet, would encounter when she has to perhaps say, uh, fill in a form of her uh, entitlement to some allowance or one thing or another. So what is the second principle? So what we want to know is what are the particular mechanisms? So we're into very much uh, looking at the institutional uh, spaces as bureaucracies in which specific procedures take place. What kind of procedures are these? These are procedures of classification, procedures of decision making, decision making related to entitlement or disentitlement. And, and uh, what we want to see is how uh, individuals in diverse local sites can experience these uh, these knowledge, these classifications, these uh, decision uh, decision making as their own. So, how they find are their experiences, how they experience themselves as belong to this uh, to the space shaped by the institutional um, characteristics. So, here is the third principle, which would be an emphasis on discourse and discursive practices. I didn't say that, but in, uh, Dorothy Smith, other than the other influences that I mentioned, she's also very much influenced by Foucault and in the sense of post-structuralist engagement with text and the power of text and the power of the categories used in a text and the power of rhetoric used in a text. And so she actually, uh, um, encourages researchers to look at the texts that are becoming part of the institutional procedures like the forms that people have to fill up, the a file that is created out of these forms, what happens to this text, what happened to the form, what happens to the file, a contract that is signed as part of the, of the procedure, so a lot of engagement with the text. And this is how, this is how Exactly, right? So this is how I introduced to your institutional ethnography and now I'd like to move into explaining what is it that I was able to find while using institutional ethnography on the area that I was interested in. I was interested, as <coughs> uh, was mentioned in this book, that I uh, published on the basis of an institutional ethnography that I conducted. I was interested in understanding what is the institutional context in which employment arrangements are designed for those people, those women uh, primarily, who are employed in privatized services. So this could be services in the area of health, of education, of welfare, and um, uh, the, these people's employment is shaped by a contract. So they really mostly don't, don't even know the people that, sh that are involved in shaping their employment arrangement and they don't even know where their level of income is being planned or decided upon. So this is what I did. I began searching for the um, 
bureaucratic space, in the institutional space in which the contracts are designed. Which contracts? The contracts of the, that the women are uh, the, that the women sign? No, the contract between the state as purchasing a service and the service deliverer. You know, because the, serv the privatized service can be delivered by a non-profit oriented organization or by a profit oriented organization. But in both cases, it is based on a contract. So that contract is what interested me. I wanted to understand how this contract is designed because this contract, although the woman who is employed with in long-term elderly care, she doesn't know of this contract. But this contract is very forceful in shaping her possibilities. For example, her possibilities to negotiate her income. She's unable to negotiate the income with her direct employment because they do not decide on the amount of money that she will get. Ooh, the, the decision is made on an institutional level. So I hope you understood. So you see here that the woman, she's not similar to the woman in in, uh, she doesn't resemble the woman in Dorothy Smith um, study because she is employed and she is employed in a privatized service. Perhaps let's think of her as one who works for in long-term elderly care. So what, I, what shapes her experience, what shapes her, her uh, possibilities of negotiation of her um, uh, employment is the assumptions that are part of the social organization of care, of service, uh, service or, um, <coughs> occupations. For example, what kind of assumption? Assumptions to do with how many carers we, we need for how many uh, people who need care assumptions of what is the uh, training that is required to work with, uh, elderly, with the elderly. The, all these assumptions are assumptions that are involved in shaping the remuneration that she's going to be entitled for, right? So what I found when I was uh, looking into that, these pro processes of shaping the contract were, was really the class and gender position that uh, encouraged women to experience their work as a sacred work, as a kind of work that for which they don't even want remuneration because this work is so nice and it's, so, it's uh, based on wonderful benevolence and who cares how much you earn and perhaps it doesn't even it's not even important how much you uh, you earn because you're an ex this excellent woman who is uh, happy to give love rather than work, right? So you see that what, uh, what was found in the study is that we have now ways of thinking that usually we used to uh, describe uh, perhaps 19th century or early 20s, uh, 20th century women um, beliefs in this way. So we have a category, am I done with my time? Probably. Just to say, just to say that what was uh, the most important finding of this study was the enormous um, power conflict between ad uh, budgeting uh, oriented administrators who are all for lowering costs and occupational, occupational standards uh, administrators who put together the professional discourse who still insist, still, still try to insist on how important uh, care is, training is, uh, the proportion between carers and those in need is, is all this actually when they are going this uh, re-education by the budgeting administrators, it shape the category of the skilled or unskilled employee. Thank you very much.